Okay, this is um, Professor Hobson. He is an expert at many things, but we've asked him to come and talk to us as an expert on the Vietnam War and primarily zooming in on Vietnam protest. Uh, how this typically works when you get to be invited to a lecture like this is he'll talk and then you can ask your questions during it if that's okay. Or sure. you can wait till the end and they can have their question time then. Both is fine. Both is fine. Okay, so that's nice to always ask a lecturer if they're okay with questions throughout. Um, and it's not rude during the lecture. Back here, what's your name? What is your name? Victor? Okay, Victor. Oh. Come on up. Come closer to us. Miles, come on. Come closer. Um, you can sit here, Miles, if you want. Uh, you can sit here or you can sit wherever. I um, it's not rude during the lecture to take notes while someone's talking. That's okay. You might not want to do that in a different situation, but when a lecture person is talking, it's okay to listen and take notes as they're talking, and that's perfectly fine. Hi, how are you? We're only getting the crowd. Yeah. Looks like more when everybody gets up here. There we go. Come on in. Uh, and what will happen is I'll tell you when we're probably 10 minutes to... Hold up. Come on, closer. Come closer. There's room here. That's right. We've got room. Spot. Here My vision gets kind of foggy when things get off. Me too. Me too. Come on in. Uh, Professor Hobson, Hobson is zeroing in on Vietnam and Vietnam protests. And we've asked that maybe you can ask your questions throughout or save them to the end. Does that sound like a plan? Okay. All right. Mr. Hobson, you're up. Professor Hobson. Whatever. Um, I kind of like art. <laughs> okay, so we can do. His first name is Art. Absolutely. Yeah, and we have some language learners in here, and his okay. first name is Art, kind of like we go to art class. Mm -hmm. Is that your, um, is Arthur. that Arthur? Yeah. Short for Arthur. Okay. Yeah, my dad like, was, um, uh, one of my dad's heroes was King Arthur. Oh, well then there so you go. So he named me Arthur. I'm oh, the okay. king. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm going to start out by telling you a little bit about myself. And then um, we'll talk about how I got involved with the Vietnam War protests in Fayetteville. And I want to hear your questions along the way, and I want to hear your thoughts and questions after I get done with all this. I was born in 1934, of all times, a long time ago, in Philadelphia. And I went through sixth grade in Philadelphia. It's on the East Coast, big city. Um, my parents moved from Philadelphia when I was in the sixth grade. I was 11 years old and we came out to Manhattan, Kansas. It's a small college town in Kansas. My dad is from Kansas originally and he was a professor there of engineering. And so I went to junior high school and senior high school in Kansas and I graduated there from high school in 52 and I decided of all things to be a musician. A lot of you probably like music, and I was just fascinated, especially with the jazz music that was very popular at that time. And so I took my trombone and I went down to North Texas State College in Texas, and I uh, went through music school. I finished up, got a degree in jazz music and in teaching music, and then they drafted me. I was in the Army for two years. It was the draft. You know, I had to be in the Army. I wouldn't have chosen to do it. But um, it was a good time, actually. I spent two years playing my trombone in bands and in orchestras in Europe, in Germany mostly. And I actually learned quite a bit. It was good travel and everything. I came back from that and uh, spent six months in New York City trying to be a jazz musician, trying, trying to get on stage with some band. I tried out with Benny Goodman's band. Anybody ever hear of Benny Goodman? Is that a familiar name for a few of you still? Maybe. <laughs> anyway, I didn't make it. I was not that much of a musician. I don't really have it in the ear. I just love music, and I still do. But you've got to have a good ear if you're going to be a musician. And um, my ear was not that good. And I realized I wasn't going to make it. So I left that. I came back to Kansas and pondered what to do next, and what to do next turned out to be to be a physicist, of all things. I could tell you how I got there, but this is supposed to be about Vietnam, so let's move on. Uh, I spent a couple of years in undergraduate school, got a second 
undergraduate degree in college in physics, and then I went on to graduate school and got a PhD uh, there in Manhattan, Kansas, and Kansas State University, it's called. And um, so with my physics doctorate, I came down here, got a job teaching at the University of Arkansas, and I've been very happily teaching and then retired for the last 15 years, uh, ever since I got here in 1964. Uh, maybe my main um, success during that time as a physicist was this textbook. This is a textbook in physics. It's called Physics, Concepts, and Connections. It's in its fifth edition. It's been out for quite a while in different editions. And it's used in a whole bunch of colleges around the United States. Um, it's used on the Fayetteville campus. It's also used on the Northwest Arkansas Community College campus. So someday when you get up uh, six years, seven years from now, you go to college, Think about taking the Physics and Human Affairs course, is what the course is called, on the Fayetteville campus and also up at Northwest Arkansas Community College. It's based on this textbook, and I think it might still be based on this textbook, hopefully six years from now. Or, uh, I'll pass that around if you want to. I've got a bunch of show and tells here. You might like to look through that for some reason. It's got no math in it. It's for non-science, for everybody. It's not a real technical book. Um, I guess that kind of takes care of where I'm coming from. I've been retired for 15 years. I happily get on my bicycle every day and, and go to the college campus, which is about a 10 minute bike ride away. And uh, so I'm, right now I'm writing a book about physics. Um, it's not going to be like this, it's a little different book. And I'm having a wonderful time. Retirement is just great. I love teaching. It's been a wonderful life, I'll tell you. Life is grand. Um, so about the Vietnam War. It started before I got to Fayetteville in 1955. You probably know that some, some of this stuff because you're, you're studying Vietnam, I understand. The war actually started in 1955 uh, when the French were there. The French colonialists were there and they kind of owned as colonial power. They, they owned Vietnam. Vietnam. It was called Indochina. There's not a map handy, so. But you probably know about Indochina. It was a large area that includes Vietnam, includes Cambodia, other countries. Uh, and it was called French Indochina, and there were the colonialist powers. There were a group of rebels against the colonialists, as was happening very frequently after the Second World War. The uh, local powers were trying to throw out the, the colonial powers from France. So they were colonizing Indochina, and so uh, most of these people were communists. They were supported and aided by Russia, the Soviet Union, and by China at the time. And they rebelled against the French colonial powers, and that was called the Indochina War, or the French Indochina War, 1955. Well, the French started to lose. In, uh, by 1960, the French were losing. In 1962, 63, 4, there was a big disaster called Dien Bien Phu. You heard of that one? That's where the French had a big defeat during, during the Indochina War. There, uh, after that, the United States got involved under President Kennedy. About 1963, in order to help the French, because we were on the side of the French, not the side of the rebels on this. And to help the French, about 1963, we got involved in it. And we got more and more and more involved, first under President Kennedy and then under President Johnson. And it was quite a dilemma for me. Um, and before I launch into these show and tell, maybe I'll just send this, uh, send this notebook around. My wife collected a whole bunch of the old newspaper articles and uh, magazines and things from that era. There's this quite a repository of information about the Vietnam War and a few other things too, like my grandfather I see is in the back here. Old mementos, but this is mostly about the Vietnam War and you're free to just leave through it if you want. There is a, it's saved in the strange pages and look at them, whatever you want to do. There are old petitions and newspaper articles and photographs, and I'm going to circulate just a little bit of that in just a minute. But um, I'm going to put this over here on table number one, and you can 
circulated around. I hope it gets back to up here. You haven't had a chance to should we get to you guys too. There's, there's that. Um, I started getting interested in the Vietnam War about 1963. I liked President Kennedy quite a bit. He was uh, like, he was a hero for a lot of us. And um, I saw that he was getting us involved in the Vietnam War, and I didn't too much like the idea. I was sort of a natural born peacemaker in some ways. Um, and it's kind of hard for me to trace exactly why, but I was very impressed with the disaster at Hiroshima. Do you know about Hiroshima? What's, what's Hiroshima mean to you folks? Any, any thoughts? Hiroshima? This is the Japanese city that the Americans bombed at the end of the Second World War. And it was such a disaster and killed so many people that the, the Japanese finally gave up at the end of the Second World War. The students who are studying the Second World War is their specialty. They know about Hiroshima. It, it pretty much ended the war. And we used a nuclear bomb. This was the first use of the atomic bomb in the world. And the second one was on the second city called Nagasaki in Japan. And that impressed me quite a bit. And I was really concerned about it, although I was just in sixth grade. Um, in 1963, when the Vietnam War had started under Kennedy, I was concerned. I didn't know if we should be fighting a war in support of the French, because I didn't think much of the idea of colonialism. I sort of thought the rebels were probably right, whether they were communists or not. So, I was dubious about the whole thing, but I couldn't make up my mind. It, was, it would be very hard for me at that time, in 1963, to come out in favor of the other side when our country was fighting in Vietnam, to come out in favor of the other side or come out in favor of our country uh, not fighting in Vietnam and getting out of that war. That was a difficult decision for me and everybody to make at the time. So I pondered that. For years, uh, for about four years, and by 1966 or 67, I decided I was really against the war. Um, and the, the war protests started about that time. Uh, 19, by 1965, there were protests on the East Coast and the West Coast against the Vietnam War, against U.S. Particip participation in it. and. Um, Eventually, I joined that movement, but it took a while for me to make up my mind. This was not an easy decision for the people who decided that. To give you an idea of the intensity of the protest, this is one of the many posters that were out there. It says, the Vietnam War continues, October 1969. 45,000 American soldiers are dead, 95,000 Saigon government soldiers are dead. 556,000 um, rebel soldiers are dead. The November draft call, they had a draft, you know, that was a very important part of the Vietnam War, was that they had a draft. They made, the government forced people of um, age 19 or 20 or so to be in the army and to go to Vietnam and fight the war. The only way you could get out of that was to, it was very hard to get out of that. A few people got out of it by, by escaping to Canada, actually. So the draft was a very big, a very big aspect of the Vietnam War. I don't think there would have been nearly the protest if there hadn't been a draft. And so this says the November draft call is for 10,000 troops. Pray for peace. Pass that around. Okay. And I've got some other show and tells here I'm going to pass around. This, this is a way of telling you about the history of the peace movement just a little bit. A very interesting part of the protest movement in Fayetteville and around the country was the way the protests got started. 
And the way it started in Fayetteville was there were two kids, I say kids, they were 18, 19 years old. Um, they were Quakers, um, a very peace-minded religious group. They were Quakers. And these, there was a, a man and a woman, 18 or 19 years old, and they were walking across the country from Los Angeles to New York City, across the country. And they would stop in towns on the way, and people like me and like churches and things would put them up for the night because they, they wanted to support these kids who were walking across the country for peace. Not with a big group, it was just the two of them, that was it. And they, but they had it planned, and they, they had planned to stay in Fayetteville for about three or four nights, and they had people there who were going to put them up, not me, but some other people that were more interested than I was, actually. And they spoke at the Presbyterian Church. They, they gave a talk about what they were doing and why the war was a bad thing and why the United States should not be in the war and why you should protest against it. And they announced that the Quakers have a Wednesday peace vigil. This was a demonstration where everybody stands out on the edge of the street, maybe holding a poster saying, end the war now or something. And they demonstrate for peace for an hour in the middle of the day. And this happened every Wednesday all across the country. They were called the Silent Vigil for Peace in Vietnam. And you'll see two photographs here. Here's one of the very earliest vigils. Uh, this happened to be a, on the square in Fayetteville. And you'll see the old post office in the back on the square. I'm right here next to the guy that's holding this, the big sign. Uh, this very early days of the peace movement. And what happened was those two students said they were going to, those two who were walking across the country, they said, we're going to be out having a peace vigil and we're going to be on such and such a street corner tomorrow, Wednesday, at 12. And we're going to stand there with our signs saying, in the war now or something. And we're going to stand there for an hour. And it's silent. We don't say anything. We don't talk to people. We just stand there silent demonstrating for peace. And we're going to be there, and if you want to join us, that would be great. So I walked across the, co the campus, and there was a lineup of people, including a few friends of mine that I knew, a couple of faculty friends. There were teachers there on the campus in Fayetteville. And I thought, well, geez, you know, I've decided I'm, I'm against this war. I had already decided that um, some uh, a year ago or so. And I thought, uh, I think this is a good thing. I like the way these kids were. I like the way the demonstration looked. You know, it seemed like a good thing, and it was. It was a good thing. So I joined it, and I stayed with it for about the next five years. Every Wednesday, the same group, a of, of varying group, a big group of people. There were probably 200 people involved in the, very actively involved. There were several hundred people in the in the peace movement in Fayetteville. And every Wednesday, it just continued, Wednesday after Wednesday, through the rain, through the snow, through the nice warm weather in the spring and everything. And we'd be out on the street corner. Here's one demonstration. There's another demonstration on the other side. It says they have stood a year for peace. That was after the first year. So there's the peace vigil. Some other th demonstrations that happened was the Vietnam Moratorium happened in 1969. It was a big national demonstration day, organized nationally. Everybody came out and they demonstrated and had their uh, marches. The march is on one side of this. This is the Northwest Arkansas Times newspaper. And here you see a picture of the, the march coming down Dixon Street, I guess. And over here on the other side is a few people, including me, holding a, holding a sign. Looks like I have the same jacket on. <laughs> this jacket is not that old. <laughs> uh, and that's those pictures are from the moratorium. Uh, might be best to leave them in the plastic. That it'll be a little safer to leave them in the plastic. If you can get it back in there in a way that they show on both sides, because uh, they'll they'll last longer that way. Some of these are not in plastic. Um, this is. Um, uh, the day about a year after the Vietnam Moratorium, when some students, <coughs> college students, got shot at Kent State University because they were in a demonstration and things got a little out of hand. The police got nervous 
and it turned out that four students were shot and killed on a Kent State campus in Ohio. And there were demonstrations across the country after that. And this is one of those demonstrations right here in Fayetteville. It was a kind of an interesting event that I won't go into more detail about. But another, another big march, big demonstration. There were hundreds of people, not thousands, but the, in Little Fayetteville, Arkansas, there were hundreds, two or three hundred people in each one of those parades, marching, holding signs, and, and asking people to get out of Vietnam. We had, uh, as part of the Vietnam Peace Movement, uh, which was, like I say, it was a hundred or so maybe people that were actively involved in this. We had a newsletter called the Vietnam Chronicle. You can read articles out of that if you want and see what we were writing about. A big event that you haven't heard of, but it was uh, quite a, a stimulating event in the, in the midst of this uh, peace movement, in the midst of the anti-war movement is the massacre at My Lai. This was an example of, you heard about My Lai? Some of you have, okay. Here's an old Life Magazine article on it showing dead bodies and, and um, grieving parents and things like that. Uh, American troops got out of hand. If you want to see a good movie that's, um, it's a fictional movie, but it's similar to the My Lai Massacre. See, um, oh, let's uh, um, Platoon, the movie Platoon. Uh, it's a good account of really what it felt like to be in the Vietnam War for the troops who were there. It was not a happy experience. So a helicopter's landing and, and uh, people who have been massacred by American troops. Not a good time for American troops. We made a big mistake there, and I think we made a huge mistake by going into that war. I really, I still, I'm, I still feel certain about that myself. I can be wrong. But, uh, we had a lot of um, advertisements in newspapers, and people would sign the ad saying, "Yes, I agree that that this tragic war must help, must end, and you can help end it." And all these people signed that ad, and we. And spent some money to put that in the newspaper. Here's another newspaper ad. This one was in the Northwest Arts of Traveler, the student magazine on campus. And this one, I think, was in the Gazette, which came out in the, across the state. So we had, ad, we had newspaper ads. This is art as a hippie uh, about 1970 or so, with my long hair and, and a beard. Um, UA physicist sees the weapon, sees weapon potential, it says. I'm not sure what, what all the article says. It's been a while. This might be about uh, nuclear weapons. I'm not sure. The question of nuclear weapons is the sort of the angle that I came into this from. I told you about Hiroshima and how that impressed me. And I'm a physicist, and the physicist, and I don't know if you know exactly what a physicist is, but as a kind of scientist, the physicists invented that bomb that they dropped on Hiroshima. And that made it, that, I've always been very aware of that. I'm not saying we shouldn't have dropped the bomb. I'm, I've always been a little up in the air about that. It did end the war. It ended that Second World War to drop the bomb. So it's not open and shut whether we should have dropped the bomb or not. It's not just a matter of bombs are always bad. Sometimes, sometimes you got to fight them. I'm kind of a pacifist, but not, not completely. Not at all. We needed to fight the Second World War. We probably needed to drop the bomb at the end of it to get it stopped. Anyway, we had debates. These are some of the debaters. Um, and I'm in here on one of these. Uh, another little part of the war protest. Um, pass them, get them onto the other desk so everyone can see. And as the la my last show and tell, we went to uh, Washington, D.C. A group of about 10 or 12 of us took two cars, drove all the way to Washington, and we talked to all of our senators or representatives, everybody that we could find in Washington. We talked to them and tried to talk them into voting against the war. And have you heard of Senator Fulbright? 
If you come across Senator Fulbright and you're researching, be sure and look up Senator Fulbright. Also look up the draft and um, look up my line and a few things like that. Senator Fulbright was the anti-war senator. And he was a very great senator. He's one of the greatest senators we've ever had, as far as I'm concerned. He's from Arkansas. For a while, he was the president of the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. So we had a real peace senator on our side in the peace movement. And we talked to Senator Fulbright. We got a nice letter from Mike Purvis, who is a friend of mine. He's still teaching on the campus. And he was working for Fulbright at that time. And uh, so here's the congressional record that came out of that in White Purvis's letter. So that's a little memento of our, of our trip to Washington. And that's all my show and tells. I've been talking too much. I want to know how much you guys to talk. We've got another 20 minutes here. Uh, we're still getting this material around here. Can Good. We, uh, you got any questions about those? Questions about the materials that he's, the, art, the artifacts he's brought. Any questions about the things he's brought? Yes. Yeah, that's an actual poster. All this is the old newspaper articles. Primary source yeah, I just documents. Said stuff. Primary source documents. There's a, a lot more of that just kind of stacked up at home. How about questions for art about, the, about Vietnam or the Vietnam protests? I want to know, was it scary? Scary times? Um, or just well, upsetting times? Well, it was, it was upsetting. It was really upsetting. But um, scary, mostly not. Standing in the peace vigil, some people came by and threw apples and tomatoes at us. Did you hear that? Nobody got hurt. Uh, that was just the case. Only somebody come in a car maybe too fast and they throw an apple or something out of the window and be coming pretty fast because the car was coming fast. Uh, just, I can't I'm think sorry. of any situation that seemed dangerous uh -huh. to me. To you. Um, there were, there, it was dangerous for those Kent State students that got shot. Who did you think was in the window there? Pardon? Who did you think that was in the window Hmm. I assumed at first that we were going to win it, but the more we got into it, we got, and the more we got bogged down, the more I thought we weren't going to win. So I changed my position on that during the war. By, when we first got in it, it looked like, like we'd be able to put enough troops over there that we'd be able to overrun the communist side. But pretty soon it looked like we were just bogged down and we weren't going to be able to win. And that was for the last half of the war. So for several years I thought we were, we were losing. And we did. We lost. It was not a good time for the United States. It was a big, big mistake. One of the two big foreign policy mistakes that we've made. The other one, I think, was going into Iraq about 1900, or about 2000, 2003, under George Bush, we went into Iraq. And that's been, that was a disaster also. Um. I know you've talked about um, some college students being um, shot and potentially killed. Was that the way with all of the protests or the people were in the Mostly, I mean, here in Fayetteville, down in Fayetteville, we had the support of the authorities pretty much. I mean, the police protected us in our parades, in our protests. The university said it was okay to have demonstrations. There was one demonstration we had where the university tried to get us to not have a demonstration, but we went ahead anyway, and it turned out to be okay. So we had the support of authorities, and usually the police supported the demonstration. Not that they, su I mean, supported people being able to demonstrate. They didn't. 
They, the police were not anti-war or anything. The police were not political. Uh, the police were generally helpful, I thought, because they they provided order and uh, they they cleared the cars out of the way so that we could have our march several times. So there was not any real danger in Fayetteville that I'm aware of but, uh, that I was there for. There was one case that I heard about that was maybe a little dangerous. So did you feel like you were in danger when you heard about those kids that were shot? No, I didn't because there's, I mean, there's always danger. There's danger when you're driving up here today. There's danger when you ride your bicycle or walk across the street. Everything's dangerous, um, a little bit, but you know, if you don't walk across the street, things get pretty boring pretty soon. To live your life, you've got to expose yourself to a certain amount of danger, and it didn't seem too dangerous to me. It was more dangerous politically. A lot of people didn't like it, and you got a bad reputation among people who didn't like it. It was things like that. You know, sometimes you lose friends who if your friend is for the war and you're against the war, this was pretty powerful disagreement. And you could lose your friend that way. If you're not careful. Um, the American, what was the purpose of the My Lai massacre? Uh, Americans thought that communist rebel troops were in my line. And so they attacked the village without knowing for sure whether there was actually any military troops on the other side there. Well, there were nothing but villagers there, as it turned out. But the, the troops were all geared to, to destroy, to shoot, to burn, burn villages and things, because they thought this village was full of rebel troops. And so when they got there and they couldn't find any rebel troops, they nevertheless went ahead and burned the village and shot the people who were there because that's what they had planned to do. It was just a huge mistake. One, and the person most responsible was the lieutenant in charge, Lieutenant Kelly. And he told the troops, as, as far as I understand it, he told the troops to go ahead and um, to, sh to kill and to burn the village. And so, and the troops did, unfortunately. It was our biggest, that was our biggest single mistake in the war. But the whole war was a mistake. The country doesn't always do the right thing. It's a democracy. Um, I love this country, but, um, but we make mistakes. And you've got to think about what the country does and decide for yourself. Don't let the government decide for you. Decide for yourself what you think is right based on, based on facts, based on read, reading the newspaper, for instance. How did it affect the war? Milai affected the war. She says, how did Milai affect the war? It affected the war by increasing the peace movement. After Milai, everybody in the peace movement was saying, remember Milai. Um, be a, a, get out of Vietnam because of my law. And so it became a cause, a reason for opposing the war. It was just a good example of what a bad job we were doing in that war. So it, did, it affected the peace movement. There was one point in the middle of the war when General Westmoreland, who was our main general over there, General, you might remember the name General Westmoreland. He's a very important figure in this, along with remembering the, the peace person on the other side, which would be Senator Fulbright. Westmoreland uh, really wanted to win the war. He was, in, he was the Army commander of U.S. forces in Vietnam for a long time. At one point, he came back and asked Lyndon Johnson, who was the president during most of the war, he asked Lyndon Johnson for more troops he already had 500,000 U.S. troops over there, half a million. That was a lot of U.S. troops. But Westmoreland asked Johnson for more troops, and jo Lyndon Johnson, the president, says, General Westmoreland, I can't give you more troops because the peace movement in this country won't let me increase the number of troops. It was too politically unpopular. 
The war had become so unpopular politically, partly because of the peace movement, that Westmoreland could not get the extra 200,000 troops that he wanted. And it was at that point, I think, that the war finally turned around and began to go downhill. And then there was a long decline during which we lost and lost and lost, and then pretty soon we just got out. 1975 was when it ended. The war lasted from 55 to 75. We got into it, the United States got into it, not until 1963. So it made a big deal. The, these, the protest, my line, well, it made a huge difference. Did you know anybody that actually made out of the war alive? Oh, yeah. Do I know anybody that made it out of the war alive? I knew, I had two friends who were Vietnam vets against the war. That was, a, that was a peace organization in the United States. There was a large national organization called Vietnam Veterans against the war. These were veterans of the US Army and Marines and Navy who had been fighting in Vietnam. They were veterans of the Vietnam War, but they were against the war. The, the US government, of course, had made them fight in Vietnam but they were against the war. And when they came back, they joined the protests and they formed an organization, Vietnam Vets Against the War. And I, I knew two of them quite well. Don Donner still lives in Fayetteville. And he's a, as far, I think he still lives there. And he's a lawyer in Fayetteville, aging. And he was, I mean, he was in the war. Um, and these guys are friends of mine. So they're, there are a lot of Vietnam vets that came back, plenty of them came back. Most troops who went over there, they didn't die. But it was very dangerous to fight in Vietnam. I don't know what percentage of the troops who went to Vietnam died there. But 50,000 troops were killed, U.S. troops. 55,000 U.S. troops. And at, any one, at the height of the war, about half a million were there, and that was rotating. So I guess that a couple of million troops probably went to Vietnam, and of those 55,000 didn't come back, they got killed. So that, that'd be a smallish percentage, I, I think that might be 5%, but, um, but it was a lot, it was a lot of troops. different than the research, just a second, the research we've been doing from computer and books, actually having a live person speak to us, a primary source of this, is such a different type of research. You can see the emotion on his face. You can see how he had to think about, someone asked him, who did you think was going to win the war? He had to sit there and think about that. That's something very different than you get when you're researching on the computer yeah. from a book. Very different. So this is your time. Think of those questions that you've been having while you research. Ask him. He's here. He's, he's taken the day to be with us, you know, to answer these questions for you. What is yours? Yes. Maybe you something like Mila and occurred today. Something like Mila occurred today. Okay. Good um, things like that have happened in Iraq and Afghanistan on a smaller level. There have been things like that happening in the wars that we're still fighting to some extent in Afghanistan. Um, it's just not as big. There, there, is, there were protest movements against the, against the Iraq war. I was against the Iraq war. I was out there in the streets against the Iraq war uh, with some other people from Fayetteville. So wars go on. They're still going on today. My opinion is America gets involved, too involved in wars. We're too poor. We should talk. But you don't have to go to war with your enemies. You can talk to them. Try to figure out how to get along with them. So, yeah, this, uh, these wars do upset me, and I do think about them. I don't, I'm not automatically against all wars, though. I, I think each one of these things over. I'm a, I'm a physicist. I'm a scientist. I, I, fi I try to figure things out. I try to think about things rationally with evidence. 
And I hope you do too. You shouldn't just make judgments based on, oh, Art Hobson seemed like he was kind of a jerk and so I disagree with him. Or Art Hobson seemed like he was kind of cool and so I agree with him. That's not the reason for agreeing or disagreeing about something as important as war and peace. You think about it. You think about what the facts really are. And I did. I thought about it hard. And so uh, it still shows up. I mean, I've got a lot of memory of that. We've talked a lot this year about suspending judgment before you actually make a claim or a statement. Mm -hmm. And I noticed you did say that you, your thoughts towards this were changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With more information, mm -hmm. more um, feeling towards it, you're, it did change. And that happens when you're writing an argument or arguing something. The more you hear about something, your argument can change. So happens all the time. Happens all the time. It's a early, judgment. In the, early in the Democrat race for for a Democratic uh, nomination in 2008, I was for Hillary Clinton, but then I changed. Uh, in the middle of that race on the side of was for Obama instead. And I've, I've always thought a lot of Obama. I think he's a really good man. I think we've got a darn good president. Um, a, lot of people, a lot of people disagree. <coughs> I've thought about that hard, believe me. And I, and I don't like a, some of the things that Obama's done. I think he's too warlike. He's too quick to get into Afghanistan and to get into Iraq. But um, I think he's a good man. He's made good judgments. Other so you think these things over. Don't come from a, a real rigid ideological position that the government's always bad or peace is always is always best. Sometimes you have to go to war, and, but sometimes you don't. And we need to think it over more carefully. And I think we need to think more about the possibilities for peace. I think the Vietnam War just demonstrates that perfectly. You need to think order about how to avoid war. Because if you're smart, I think we can avoid it. I've been involved in lots of other stuff. Peace movements, and the one that bothers me the most right now is global warming. I'm very concerned about that. So I, th I think about a lot of different things like this that are kind of related to science. So, as, you know, you can ask some broader questions if you want. It doesn't have to be about being honest. What is, what is your um, researching question right now? What is your inquiry statement that y'all ask? Um. <clears throat> Does anyone have their guiding question for their research? Yeah, that would be interesting. What are some of the questions you're asking in your research? How do you think the government kept, um, the other people, like, why didn't they tell them that Asia was dangerous? Say it one more time. Why didn't the government tell the people that Asia was dangerous? Why didn't the government tell people that Angel, that Agent Orange was dangerous? Agent Orange was a poison that killed the trees and stuff because they were, because the the rebels were hiding in the forests, and they wanted, and the Americans wanted to kill the forests so that the the rebels wouldn't have a hiding place in the forest. But uh, but uh, this uh, chemical that killed the trees also was dangerous to people, and they sprayed it from airplanes. They flew over in big planes and in large amounts. They spread this poison all over Vietnam. And the, as I understand it, the uh, after effects of that poison are still there, as are a lot of our bomb craters from the war, too. But the effects are still there. We cover that up. Like, the government will cover up things in war because um, it becomes a military secret. They don't want to lose the war. They, uh, if they tell everybody that Angel, Agent Orange is dangerous, they're afraid that more American troops will get killed because they won't be able to poison the trees. And so basically the, the government's position on this, the Army's position on this, would be we need to poison the trees in order to save our troops' lives who are fighting this war. And if that's dangerous for the people of Vietnam, that's too bad. 
but we can't tell everybody about this because if we do, they'll make us stop poisoning the trees and then American troops are going to get killed. So that's, I mean, that's why. There are military reasons for doing these things. And that's what happens in war. That's the tragedy of war, that you could even use a reason like that. I think it's terrible that we poison those trees. But we, it was a secret. It was a military secret. But it was also killing people. What happened to the people that um, got poisoned by the What happened to the people that got poisoned by Agent Orange? Uh, I don't know if many died or not. I don't know what. I don't have any statistics on that. I understand that a lot of people got sick from it. I understand that a lot of American troops got sick from Agent Orange. A similar thing happened in the Iraq War. There was a lot of pollution in the Iraq War. And a lot of American troops got exposed to it. And then they had funny effects afterwards, nervous problems and things, and um, problems with their nervous system. And some of this was blamed on the chemicals that were used in the, in the war. But um, it's hard to say. I feel certain that a lot of Vietnamese and a lot of American troops got poisoned with Agent Orange, and surely some of them died from that cause, but it's always hard to tell. Part of the tragedy of war. Would it cause cancer? Would it cause cancer? I could imagine it could, but I, I wouldn't want to say that it does because I don't know. But um, yeah, it probably probably does cause cancer. It's a it's a deadly poison. If it kills trees, it's not good for biology and I'm biology too. You know, I'm a living thing. And so I, I'm a little leery of anything that's going to kill a tree that easily. And when you spray it all over the countryside in those huge amounts, boy, I wouldn't want one. So we were doing a lot of dangerous things. This is the tragedy of war. This is the reason you want to keep this country out of war if you can. It's a hard thing to balance. This is the reason you've got to think about politics. It's hard to balance. It's hard to figure out. Yes, you want to figure out how to do the right thing. Alright, well, we sure do appreciate you coming. My goodness. They're quiet. They don't have too many... Yeah, I... They're thinking I, I get in my lecture mode too much. Maybe. I mean, when you do... when uh, Y'all haven't been to one of the lectures in here, I don't think. Um, how it'll happen is when I dismiss you by your teacher, you can swing by and say thank you to Art. That's polite to do after a lecture series. Um, but if you have a particular question that you don't feel safe asking in the whole group, you're welcome to stay and just kind of ask that sure. separately, and that's perfectly sure. fine. Sometimes that happens after a lecture. You know, you just think of something, and if he has time, he'll you know, talk to you. All right, so here's what's going to happen. If you're in Miss Brown's class for language arts, you may walk back to your room and make sure you stop by Mr. Art and say thank you. All right. If you are in thank Ms. you, folks. Yes. For being a you are in Ms. Oh, this sounds clap. like a great project. It's important like to clap after a lecture. You can see how it works. Art is everybody is a, like an expert at different pieces from World War II all 